heads in ink. Let us journey, journey into the world of drawing random heads from imagination with an ink pen. All right, let's start with um, materials here. So the pen that I'm using is the Pilot Lucina Fine Point. It has normal black ink in it. The last time I did a video like this, I was using brown ink, but we got black ink this time. And I am drawing in the medium size moleskin sketchbook. That is there, that's a specific sketchbook line that moleskin has. It's not one of their regular notebooks, it has a bit thicker paper. And uh, yeah, love the moleskin sketchbooks. I've been using them for many years. They take pencil very well, they take ink very well. They're one of the few sketchbooks that reliably has high quality paper in them. I do recommend them. Uh, you could do good finish work on them. There's very few other, at least for smooth paper, there's very few other smooth paper sketchbooks that have such high quality paper. So yeah, I do recommend them, excellent stuff. So what am I doing here? Um, well, I did a video like this a couple years ago where I sketched some faces in ink from reference from uh, the Earth's World Instagram page, which I love and is still great. This time I am doing them from imagination. Well, mostly from imagination. So I actually started the first two heads. So this one that you're seeing right now and the next one that I start doing, I was, I had the Earth's World Instagram page open, but uh, I was not drawing a particular uh, image from the Earth's World page. I was more using it as what I think of as a benchmark inspiration. So what do I mean by that? I mean that I was just looking at it to remind me of what heads can be, how far out they can be, what the range of variety is, what the standards for structure and lighting are, but I wasn't actually drawing uh, from them for direct reference. And I do do that all the time uh, when I'm drawing and especially when I'm designing. I think that it's very important even when working from imagination to just remind yourself how complex and sophisticated the world actually is and how complex and sophisticated real things are. But then once I have that in my head, usually I just wanna feel free to go nuts and to just make whatever I want to make. Now, drawing from imagination means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And beyond what it just means, uh, people do it for different reasons, right? So some people wanna draw from imagination because they have particular kinds of things they want to draw that there really just is no reference for. There's no um, reference for a spiraling beast made out of wind and smoke that is made up of the amalgamated anatomies of bovine creatures and platypuses. You know, there's just, you can sort of piece that together from different real world references. Um, but there is no direct reference for such a thing. Um, you'll either need to make it up based on what's living inside of your visual library or create your own reference, right? Which, you know, if your path for that is to sculpt that thing, well, you're still just doing it from imagination. At some point, your imagination is going to have to do the heavy lift instead of anything that could just be found in reality. So. That's uh, one that a lot of people have, you know, just their artistic influences and their artistic desires have led them down a path where they just need to work on stuff, want to work on stuff that there's no references for. Then there's different reasons. Uh, and I, this one is mine on most days, I feel like. Some people just wanna draw from imagination because it's more fun for them. So I spend a lot of time drawing from my head things that I know it'd be very easy for me to find a reference for. Why, why? Now th this, is, this brings us to a point of debate in art education and art philosophy. And a lot of people will say there is no good reason to do that, that you are only holding your 
work back, right? You are never going to imagine the drawing with as much fidelity and grace and surprising little nuances as that same drawing would have had if you had sought more references for it. And I have to say that I am inclined to agree that that it will usually be the case most of the time. Most drawings done from imagination would indeed be improved by some amount of reference being involved, um, especially if we open our mind to getting reference later in the process, which is my preference. Um, I think having too much reference right up front can sort of stifle you, but there's uh, almost always a good time to introduce it into the process, even if you began from imagination. So I'm inclined to agree with those people, but there is a ve that very good reason to do so anyway, which is that you find it more fun. You find it more free. It just makes you feel better in the moment. Now, very uptight, very uh, wanting to control your whole life and the nature of your creativity kinds of art teachers, which if you've never encountered one, <laughs> there's a lot of them and they have ruined lots of people's lives and creativity, uh, at least for a while. Um, you're very, you should count yourself lucky if you've never encountered one of these kinds of art teachers who with a careless word that they didn't even pay uh, much thought to um, will set people on the wrong path for years, right? Um, they will often say that, you know, your, your feelings of fun, your feelings of joy, they're really kind of immaterial here, right? You want to make good drawings, don't you? You know, what, you know what's the most fun? Making the best looking drawing, right? Again, another philosophical impasse, I would say for some people that is going to be the case, but for others, uh, no, you know, the, for others, the, the process of sort of foregoing your moment to moment joy to make a pretty picture at any and all costs is not worth it. It removes all the fun from the process and yeah, it might make it give you a sort of reliable process to deliver on a deadline over and over again, but um, it might also contribute to burnout because you're not, however long it takes you to make a picture, let's say it's 100 hours, you're miserable the whole time, right? So again, I count myself in this camp. I need the process to feel fun the whole time. And one of the most fun ways for me to work is just completely from my head. So I practice it and I do it all the time, even for stuff that it would be very easy for me to go get reference for. Um, all right. I opened right off the bat with a lot of art philosophy. So let me just remark on what the heck I'm actually doing here. I think of this as playing a game with myself and I call that game, don't draw the same head twice. That's all I'm doing here. I start with whatever, a fantasy character, an older person, a younger person, male, female, and I go from head to head and I just try to not repeat the exact same type. Beyond that, I don't put many strictures on myself, but just this little bit of structure tends to force me to find range um, and pull from different parts of my uh, memories of what the face looks like, what the head looks like. But obviously you could do this with any kind of content and I would recommend that you do. So you could do this with uh, vases, right? Which is a, an exercise that I've done many times and is in, um, I recommend it and go through it in one of my tutorial videos, which is uh, exercises for beginners, where you just try to fill a page with as many different types of vases as you can imagine. So skinny ones, squatter ones, very tall ones, very wide ones, ones that have square, uh, details, ones that have curvy details. So it can be applied to anything. But uh, with faces, I love this exercise because it really just makes you do such a different, such a wide variety of types. It makes you jump around a lot. And I find that after I've done, you know, just three or four heads, suddenly I'm, I'm reaching. Now I'm stretching. Now I'm really having to think a little bit more 
right? You're not, you don't have to rack your brain. It can still be a very relaxing sketchbook exercise, which is how I think of this as well. But um, you do have to push, you know, you gotta look for more angular, then you gotta go a little bit softer. You've gotta go for a more sinister looking character, a more friendly looking character. You've gotta look for someone who looks like they, you gotta try to draw someone who looks like they take care of themselves. You've gotta draw someone who looks like they don't really care about their appearance. And you just wind up practicing a lot of things that you otherwise wouldn't have if you were just sort of rotely drawing ahead and you're gonna wind up drawing the same kind of type, the same kind of character over and over and over again. Now, uh, it should be clear that one of the main things that's going to make you better at an exercise like this is drawing from reference at other times, right? So drawing the world as is, is in my opinion, the best way to familiarize yourself with what can only be described as the miraculous, exuberant, over the top, borderline hysterical amount of variety that is actually present in the real world. I mean, I, I agree with, you know, the, the, the old adage of designers that you're just never going to make up anything as interesting as nature, right? I love the power of the imagination. I love people who are drawing, painting, making any kind of art sort of to the beat of their own drummer where it's kind of shocking how the hell they even came up with that. I love designs that seem utterly alien and almost like there's no reference point. I love those things as much as anybody else, but um, I think that most artistic products that seem that way only seem that way. They are just referencing things that uh, you're not familiar with, right? But maybe the artist is, and they're uh, combining interesting things that the artist has seen with interesting internal emotions that that artist has. And, you know, usually, you know, no reference point is unique, right? No matter how esoteric and niche you go, no matter how far back you go in art history, um, there's nothing you could reference that no one else knows about, right? Someone out there knows it, but once you integrate your emotions, your personal life experience, then things start to get really unique, right? Then, then you really start adding something in that really nobody can replicate that because only you have had those experiences. But um, that aside, yeah, you can't, you can't beat nature. Nature is completely wild and the greatest thing that nature does is that it educates you over and over again. It reveals to you how boring you actually are, how unimaginative you are, how restrained you are, how, how not open you are to possibilities. With heads, one of the main things that I find nature um, teaches me over and over again is that really you could draw any face. I mean, a you could think you are pushing it so far that you're making a full, just caricature, a grotesque, you know, just like a, a real wild out there facial structure that just could not be. And the truth is that you draw it and somebody out there has that face. Somebody out there has something really close to that face. People look wild, right? People look like every damn type of possibility uh, is somebody's face. If you need evidence of that, go look at uh, the Earth's World Instagram page. That'll show you that there really is every kind of face slapped onto skulls out there in the world. So the great thing about realizing that, and it's difficult to realize purely conceptually, you need to see it and have be reminded of it so many times that you really feel it in your bones. Once you hit that point, the great thing about that is that you will free up in the way that you draw. You will just be much more inclined to accept whatever goes down and not worry so much about, 
oh, am I breaking proportion? Am I, am I not obeying the rules? Is, this, is the structure on this bad? It, 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 should this be up? Should this be down? These things should be more aligned. It's not symmetrical enough. It's like all of those considerations are useful in particular situations right if you're if you're going for a particular type right there's there's no getting around it. if you're trying to draw someone who looks like a model you are going to go for quite a symmetrical face except that let's remember that when you say i'm trying to draw someone who looks like a model uh, what you mean is i'm trying to draw someone who looks like the models i'm familiar with the current contingent culturally determined guaranteed to change standards of beauty, right? And ours right now tends to have something about symmetry, right? But once you leave those particular situations behind, once you open your mind a little bit more, um, symmetry is not always useful. It's not always going to give you the results that you want. And if you keep hunting it just for its own sake, you are closing yourself off to an infinitude of facial types that exist out there. Um, so I don't think that you should just take those little rules upon yourself without scrutinizing them. Um, you should bring them into the process only when you know that that's what you want and need for what you are going for. Um, as you shed a lot of those sort of rule burdens, right, you find that you can just just draw. You can just open up. You can just do kind of whatever. You can really just seek what this particular drawing looks like. This head doodle. What does this one look like? And then you can troubleshoot it and ask diagnostic questions um, in reference to the drawing itself rather than to external standards. And I think, I think that when you do that, uh, that is the path to winding up at some more interesting things, more freedom, and uh, hopefully, eventually, a more personal kind of design language um, that is not purely aligned with this lowest common denominator, um, this is what everybody else is drawing to kind of a thing. And I don't know. That's not for everybody, but I think that for a lot of us, that is kind of what we're hoping to get to eventually. As you can see in the drawing right now, uh, that has led me to discovering the beauty of goblins, naturally. Uh, I can't help it. I can only draw so many normal people before I need to uh, pepper and salt my life with some goblin drawings. Y you got to do it. I mean, if, if you're not drawing goblins, what are you doing? Okay, I, I, I ask you earnestly, what are you doing? What, what, what's in your sketchbook? Cute kitty cats? I mean, yeah, maybe you do a few cute kitty cats, but at a certain point, you gotta throw some goblins in there. All right, enough goblin talk. This whole thing could be goblin talk if we're not careful. But um, yeah, I think that a personal design language, a personal way of drawing is, is what a lot of us are going for. Not everybody, right? Some people just wanna hit a particular beauty standard or something like that that they feel is external. They're really trying to work within a school, within an established modality, and that's fine. But I think a lot of us, art is very personal for us, and we do want to find something that is uniquely our own. And I think that that does go deeper than style in, in air quotes. I think that it goes all the way down to how we think about art, uh, our our then, then how that informs how we think about the world, right? Because art is generally very linked with our overall outlook. It's sort of our outlook determines the kinds of things we will tend to make and the kind of art that we would tend to be interested in. Um, and it's weird to assume that you would be able to find that unique worldview vantage point way of making art by simply trying to hit these external standards that we don't really understand and that no one is ever really going to give us a stamp of approval for anyway, right? It's like, unless you're in an art school, 
getting the occasional A grade on an assignment, no one's ever gonna come over and rubber stamp your drawings and say, ah, you did it, you hit quality. Now everybody knows that you draw well, right? I mean, a lot of us, that's the fevered, miserable, desperate little dream that a lot of us had. Like, please, please just somebody tell me I'm good, finally. But it ain't coming, baby. It ain't coming, no one's gonna do it. The only, it only matters, do you like the way you're working, right? And again, a lot of the considerations here are, are based on do you like the way you're working, right? The outcomes of the drawings, they introduce new questions, different questions, right? I, I personally try not to worry too much about how the drawings come out. I, I find that if I'm having a huge amount of fun moment to moment, that is that gives me fuel to make the pieces as good as I might need them to be, right? If, if I try to do it the other way around, if I focus purely on the surface quality, then I, I just lose interest. You know, there's only so long that can keep me energized. And I'm enough of an anxious overthinker that if that's my main motivation and I'm working on something for 40 hours, that basically becomes 40 hours for me to slowly re-educate myself on how there's always somebody making better work than me. And um, comparison is definitely the thief of, thief of joy there. And it, I, I don't know, I, I've never been able to get through that. You know, other people, they have different relationships to comparison. They can only get motivation from it, right? They can excise all of the negative aspects of comparison and they can just focus on the good stuff, the, the healthy competition, the wholesome rivalry aspects of it. And I've been able to ride that edge for some bits of time at various points of my life, but I don't know, these days I just find, um, it only hurts, you know, I'm not, I'm not strong enough to swim in that for all of the hours necessary for my practice. Um, I instead need moment to moment fun, freedom, relaxation, non-judgment, uh, just the raw rejuvenation of creating things over and over and over again and not being so bogged down with these impossible standards. Just let's see what comes out this time, that over and over and over again. All right, this head that I just drew, you'll see that I started it with a weird shape and then just imagined a face into it. Uh, that lets you know that I am, was out of ideas. You know, I, I was continuing to play the game of don't repeat the same head and I really was at a loss for where I wanted to go next. So I just drew this random oblong, like upside down pear shape. And I said, let's make it a face. Um, it's a classic exercise. Uh, a lot of cartoonists do that all the time. And if you've never tried it, I mean, fill a sketchbook with that. It's, it's always good fun. I just did it again. I did sort of a rounded trapezoid shape there with a wider bottom instead of a narrower bottom, like the first one that I did. And I'm turning that into God only knows what this guy is. Some sort of sneering, like overly polite, obsequious and powerful uh, guy named Franklin, I wanna say. He just strikes me as, as a Franklin. He, he's giving off Franklin energy. And he's got some really pronounced pearly whites and I don't know, he just seems a little, a little too friendly, a little too friendly. He's got a kind of unctuous, like, yes, oh, I'd be happy to fulfill your request, sir. Uh, if only you make a promise that when I need something, the favor will be repaid. You know, he's got that kind of a feeling to him. And all of that, just comes for free, preloaded, in the shape. No, it doesn't. I'm just kidding about that. I mean, you could turn any kind of shape into any kind of thing if you are a crafty enough designer. Um, but it is amazing how much the initial shape will guide the energy of the character. 
I mean, there is classic uh, design theory behind this. You know, more angular shapes will tend to feel more aggressive, less friendly, less inviting. More rounded shapes will feel just the opposite, more inviting, more friendly, things like this. It's important to note that all of those expectations can be subverted. Um, the idea that, you know, a triangle always means aggressive, mean, unstable, you know, that's cute, but a little naive, not fully mature. Um, the truth is that there are so many conditions on any given design, right? Once you take it just off the page and you put it into its context, right? The story, the other characters around this character or prop or environment, what have you, that if you carefully orchestrate not just the design of an individual object, but its context, then you can subvert all design theory. You can make a very pointy triangular character that does feel friendly. You can make a round squishy character that um, does feel threatening, right? Uh, you can look at, which one was it? I think uh, Toy Story 3 had the uh, baby character, the baby doll character that uh, was like this horrifying villain. Um, the teddy bear became the main bad guy, right? It's like, a te it shouldn't be possible to make a teddy bear threatening, right? If we're going to believe design theory just as is, it shouldn't be possible. But you control the lighting, you control the story, you control the characters who are around him, flanking him, and wouldn't you know it, he's the threatening villain, right? And, and he's the uh, number one problem that the characters need to face. So just remember that all little design theory, things like that, they all can be subverted. Uh, and it's up to you how far you wanna go with it. Certainly when you push the subversions, uh, you tend to get to some very memorable and strange things. Um, so I stopped doing the random shades and went back to uh, just drawing faces in the more straightforward way that I tend to. Looking at all of this now, uh, I could have gone way wilder. I mean, I definitely could have sought more variety of textures, again, not not having that variety of textures, I take that to just mean I need to go back to reference drawing. I just need to spend more time looking at the real world and reminding myself both conceptually um, what variety of textures are out there, but also, and I think this is key, feeling in my hand what it feels like to draw those textures. That I think is very important and something that people don't think enough about. I think that if you wanna draw well from imagination, you've got to pay close attention while you draw from reference and remember those feelings. How often are you doing short lines? How often are you doing long lines? How often are you doing itchy, scratchy little textures? How long are you doing um, like graceful larger shapes for textures? Uh, one that has always stuck with me is how often do you find yourself surprised while you draw from reference? For me, the answer was I'm surprised constantly. I'm always seeing lines that I wouldn't expect to be there. Um, I'm always constantly surprised by how a limb or a mass on the body occludes another limb or mass on the body. And it took me a long time to realize that I've got to bring that element of surprise into the imagination drawing. If I want the imagination drawings to feel anything like the fidelity and reality of the world that I see. And it took a long time to realize that and then even longer to actually integrate that into the way that I draw. But when I did, it was a huge eureka. It did so much to make my imagination drawings feel more naturalistic. Um, so I would greatly encourage you to pay very close attention to everything that's happening when you draw from reference, including the sort of out there experiential, phenomenological, like how it feels stuff, and bring all of that into the imagination drawing. Um, I mean, it's a, Definitely a magical ask, you know, it's, it's a weird, almost psychedelic thing, but uh, it's art.
Ain't that how it goes, you know? All right, well, I had a lot of fun doing this sketch page. Uh, thank you so much for watching and good luck with your drawings. Um, keep those sketchbooks full. Uh, may your pencils always be sharp and may your inkwells always be full. All right, everybody, take care. Thank you for drawing today.